Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's a really, really impressive crowd. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we are really excited about this event. So I wanted to give a little background on this event. Uh, we're here hosting the, the event is titled is the United States above the law of human rights. And this is co-sponsored by the ACLU, the Center for Civil and Human Rights, the, uh, the International Human Rights Society and the uh, Hispanic Law Students Association. So this came about because last year the ACLU hosted a uh, defense attorney named Thomas Durkin who worked defending uh, detainees at Guantanamo Bay. And Mr. Durkin, he was a little discouraged about the legal system here. Uh, understandably so, he had had several detainees who were actually approved for release and because of administrative problems were never able to actually be released from Guantanamo Bay. They're still there to this day. I don't have uh, And so he was, he was pretty discouraged. And uh, one of the students in the crowd raised her hand and she said, is there any way that international law can step in to fix these problems where the United States has failed. And Professor O'Connell responded, I think that the US courts still hold remedies for wrongs like this. Why not go through the US court system when these are clearly constitutional wrongs? And Mr. Durkin, he took a pretty negative view on that too. He basically opined that, uh, that the United States court system is broken, that there's nothing we can do at this point to uh, to remedy some of these human rights and civil rights wrongs that are being perpetrated by our government. And Professor O'Connell, she wanted to rebut that. And, and, and we're gonna do that now. That's what we're gonna okay. do. Yeah, right, awesome. then, right then and there in April, uh, Professor O'Connell said, you know what, I'm gonna have to give a follow-up talk about this. And I was like, you know what, we're gonna host that talk. Yeah, so. uh, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> So thank you, Laura, for following up. Um, and I've really appreciated having the chance to think about this question and then uh, and, and roped my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Castle in because um, it's, a big, it's a big topic. And the two of us have agreed to talk for maybe 12, no more than 15 minutes, and then have more ideas from all of you. And what I was searching for just now while Laura was speaking is that I got a, a, a photo um, uh, a Twitter uh, photo from Tom Durkin yesterday with the hashtag under his name, Defend Gitmo Defenders. So that's what he's doing right now. I think many of you will know about the, uh, the, the three defense attorneys, one of whom uh, has been a, a longtime member of the defense group at Guantanamo Bay. He's from Indianapolis. He is a criminal defense lawyer there, uh, Richard Kamen and then uh, two others who have refused to continue defending one of the uh, detainees because of uh, unnamed confidential prosecutorial, allegations of prosecutorial uh, misconduct. So we're still waiting to hear what's happening to that. But while those three have refused to continue to serve because they do not believe they can give their client an adequate defense, the military officer in charge of the defense group at Guantanamo Bay is currently in detention for refusing to demand that those defense attorneys return to defending their case. So he is serving a 21 day um, detention period, uh, which I'm, I'm from an army family. My husband was in the United States Army. Um, and, uh, and one of the surprising things with that whole episode is that um, the person in charge, the military officer in charge of the defense group is a general and the judge who has put him in detention is a colonel. So um, that's a, a noteworthy aspect of the whole thing. But Tom Durkin himself, who is an amazing criminal defense lawyer from Chicago, who has probably the best record, I think you'd agree with me, um, Doug, of lawyers in private practice defending people accused of terrorism in this country. He's had some true noteworthy, uh, we don't really call them wins, but he's been able to limit some of the more extreme um, sentencing uh, requests that prosecutors have made for a number of, of uh, people convicted of violating terrorism statutes. So Tom was at a low point, but somehow and, and this is part of my message to all of you today, 
he is someone I admire and who keeps me going because no matter how disappointed and discouraged he gets, I see where he ends up. The next time I'm communicating with him, he's back in court. He's, he's researching yet another impossible case. He doesn't give up. Um, he is a, a product of this university and it shows. So I wanna make for all of you today three points. His criticism, his concern about whether our courts in the United States are taking a sufficiently appropriate view, if they are taking a respectful view of the obligations that they have to adjudicate and implement basic human rights, whether from within our own constitution and our Bill of Rights, our jurisprudence in the area of civil rights, our civil rights statutes, or from the international system, and in many ways those are, are a combined set, whether our courts are sufficiently respectful of those principles is a problem today. That, that is a, a clear problem. That's my point one. But my second point to you is that we have to be very careful about diagnosing exactly what that problem is. If we're interested in ameliorating that problem, we'll have to figure out, and we have to be very careful to know what the problem is. You don't get a good remedy unless you have a proper diagnosis. And I'm quite concerned that some of the loose talk and some of the uh, commentary around this subject is either overstating the problem or misdiagnosing it. And that means we could end up through best of intentions in a worse place than we are now. So that's my second point to you that I'll return to. And the third one is that no matter how serious, number one, the problem is, or two, how difficult it is to figure out how to attack it, how to tackle it, how to, how to ameliorate it, we can never give up on our courts. By definition, we cannot give up on our courts. Not any citizen of this country, any citizen of the world, we need our courts. They're essential to our life and community. And just regardless of how bad the problems are, our job is to keep on keeping on. We have to continue responding, finding ways, being persistent. Okay, so let me go back to number one. I'm just going to throw out six big areas where I personally am heartbroken by failures of our courts. And I have these uh, in some what order of, I think, imperative difficulty, imperative problem. The number one area where our courts have been supine, where they have not, where US courts have failed abysmally to protect human rights is in the area of targeted killing. Actually using bombs and missiles outside of armed conflict zones, whether delivered by drones or through car bombs or uh, conventional aircraft or ships to kill large numbers of people with no respect for the United Nations Charter prohibition on the use of force with no respect for the fundamental human right to life out of an argument of necessity based on some idea of security is to me the most serious problem we're facing. We've tried again and again, Professor Castle and I tried uh, submitting an amicus brief last fall in a case um, called Ali Jabber versus the United States. The facts absolutely compelling. Courts, Number one reason that the plaintiffs lost in uh, the district court and lost unanimously at the Court of Appeal, not the job of the courts. Not the job of the courts. I'll tell you a little more about why I'm still hopeful even, and, and I think our, our effort was worth it when I get to number three. But that's, I think, the worst Thing that's going on right now in this country, and it's not a partisan attack. President Clinton began the program of targeted killing. President Bush doubled down. President Obama doubled down on Bush. And President Trump 
No one's even paying attention to the issue anymore. It's going on all the time. We've done drone strikes in Somalia, Yemen, Syria, places um, highly problematic. That's my number one category. My number two is Guantanamo Bay, everything that's happening there. And just this fall, just a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court refused to take, uh, to grant certiorari in the most controversial case, I think, pending currently at Guantanamo Bay. And that is the application of the crime of conspiracy to an individual who has committed no tangible crime. Guantanamo Bay and the military commissions there were supposedly set up to try violations of the law of armed conflict, which is international law, and it does not include conspiracy. And yet the US government now is going to try people at Guantanamo Bay for conspiracy, and the Supreme Court has refused to stop it. Third category, migrant rights. I don't think I need to give anyone any examples. Criminal justice, mass incarceration, excessive use of force with inadequate response by the courts, and the death penalty. Category number five, equal protection under the law. Civil rights, human rights. In the United States, in terms of how our government treats people, how we treat each other, but also being part of an international answer to the failure of, of human rights worldwide. Number six, environmental protection. Can anyone name the last big important environmental victory at the US Supreme Court for the environment? Right. So those are my problem areas where important areas of, of international law that have real clear impacts on human rights are not being respected. Are not, our, our courts are not stepping up, not doing their job and applying the most black letter rules that you can imagine. Why are these cases happening? Why are we at this point? What's the answer? What is the <laughs> diagnosis? Well, despite the fact that that sounds like a really dreary and awful set of problems, understandably leading even a veteran like Tom Durkin to throw up his hands and say, I have no trust any longer in American courts. Let's not overstate this problem. We have been here before. There have been times in our history and we have tackled problems as bad as that whole list that I've just given you. Let's think about the history of litigation to end slavery, which did not end well. The courts were unable and through real miscarriages of justice. In fact, we're still litigating that, that, that last, one of my later categories of, of human rights and civil rights, we're still fighting that battle. But that uh, has to be compared to the, the fight and such an, a horrendously immoral institution a hundred years of litigation before we even ended uh, basic segregation. And not to mention that Dred Scott has to go down in history as the most immoral decision of, of our Supreme Court. So we've been here before, but even more a problem of, of more comparable to my first ones. I remember, I'm sure Professor Castle does, all the litigation <laughs> brought to try to end the civil or the Vietnam War. Tr people being drafted and saying, I don't want to fight in an unlawful, immoral war. Courts would not take those cases. There's not a single Supreme Court case questioning the right of the United States, even though international law is part of the law of the United States. It's the obligation of the courts to apply that law to government institutions. But they said the same thing that these more recent decisions on targeted killing. Separation of powers can't go there. It was how, how did the Vietnam War finally, how did the United States finally end its role in an unlawful war? Through the Congress. So the courts may not be doing their job, but let's figure out if, if the job we're criticizing them for is truly for the courts or should we be looking to the other branches? <laughs>
Should we be putting pressure on our members of Congress? Should we be active in elections? Should we be watching carefully the votes? We've got a really tall order on targeted killing. There's almost nothing more popular than the drone in, in Congress. It's, it's one of those very rare and amazing issues on which members of Congress are, are in unison, despite the clear violation of the law. So can we blame the courts for not doing more when Congress has plainly got a role, plainly doing nothing? So let's not overstate and let's not, uh, uh, and let's be careful about uh, what we're asking the courts to do versus other uh, accountable aspects of our government. But I long <laughs> thought about why are these things happening? Why are they happening now and how can we reverse it? And I, I think part of the uh, problem is that we've been in a long, slow period in which our judges know less and less international law. I think that is part of diagnosing the problem. I think when they read um, an amicus brief that cites international cases that they have been, <coughs> that they know nothing about, I, I, I believe it's the case increasingly that judges uh, are either very skeptical or have inadequate education about international law. And that is um, uh, part of the diagnosis. That is part of the problem that we should start addressing. But it's not in terms of leaving the courts. So let me go on to my, my third point so I don't take up too much of the time here. And that's about courts being essential and, 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 and the fact that we simply can't leave them. One of the things I think we learn in international law is that of the three branches of government, courts are probably the most essential. The international legal system exists without a legislature and without an executive branch, but it has courts. You can't have any kind of a legal system without courts. So we need our courts. And we need to be persistent in trying to improve them. So one of the things I think we all can play a role in is better educating our judges about international law. But why do we have a large segment of the judiciary not interested and not well informed? Um, and why do I think that's a newer problem? I think a reaction to the activist judging of the 1960s in the era of civil rights, when this whole idea of an activist judge legislating from the bench for the good of society, that was uh, heavily criticized and rejected by uh, a number of legal academics as well as members of our American community. And a response was built over time in a slow, slow and very effective way that's had its impact now. So part of the answer to the problem I'm discussing will be a long, slow reversal of that movement. It was a movement to put judges who would take a more conservative view of all these questions into office. And it was very successful. Uh, one academic alone, really by himself, founded an organization that all of you have heard of, the organization with more student members at this law school than any other, the Federalist Society. That was a response to activist judges of the 1960s and 70s, and it's had its effect. So if you want to reverse that and have judges who are more open to a global and cosmopolitan view that includes international law and understanding what our founding fathers understood about international law, that it's part of our law, essential to our lives, essential to be applied by the courts as often as problems relevant to international law come up. It, it's, it, we're gonna have some short-term victories and we've had some real victories. I hope Professor Castle will use some of his time to talk about those to keep us uh, uh, from getting too uh, despairing. But we have to educate ourselves in international law, we have to educate the courts, and we have to promote as citizens and in our law schools, the teaching of international law and maybe even institutional responses that can have an answer to some of the, I think, very well put arguments by um, the Federalist Society. So here's, uh, if I can have one more minute. Here's one of the decisions that I think does give me reason for hope. 
and an opening to education and maybe the courts even seeing that finally they've gone too far and ignoring some of these important issues. And that's uh, uh, the decision in the case I mentioned that Professor Castle and I worked on, Ali Jabber versus the United States. So we lost all three judges, but there's a very unusual long concurrence by the judge writing the, um, the chief judge writing the, uh, writing the main decision. She could only get two of her fellow judges to join in this. But I wanna read just a little bit of her long separate concurrence. Um, it, she talks about the fact that it's for the Congress to check the executive branch's power in military force decisions in a drone attack of the kind described in our case. And then she says, but if judges are not going to out, uh, 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 so she said that's their job, but they're not doing it and the courts haven't been doing it. She admits that the courts haven't been doing it. And so then she asked the rhetorical question, if the courts will not, if the judges will not check this outsized power, who will? No high-minded appeal to departmentalism, separation of powers, arguing that each branch must, in the exercise of its function, be guided by the text of the Constitution, changes the fact that every other branch of government seems to be passing the buck on the drone issue. The president is the best equipped to police his own house. Uh, but despite an impressive number of executive oversight bodies, there's pitifully little oversight within the executive. Presidents are slow to appoint members to these boards. Their operations are shrouded in secrecy, and it often seems the boards are more interested in protecting and, and excusing the actions of agencies than holding them accounts, accountable. Congress, perhaps? But congressional oversight is a joke. This is, this is Judge Rogers, Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia, she says, and a bad one at that. Anyone who has watched the zeal with which politicians of one party go after the lawyers and advisors of the opposite party following a change of administration can understand why neither the military nor the intelligence agencies puts any trust in congressional oversight committees. They are too big, they complain bitterly that briefings are not sufficiently in depth to aid them in making good decisions, but when they receive detailed information, they all too often leak like a sieve. Our democracy is broken. We must, however, hope that it is not incurably so. I think words like that are the next step before a Judge Rogers votes against the executive branch in its unlimited power. So I think we're at that moment. And with that, I turn it over to Professor Castle. Well, I was expecting Professor O'Connell to be a bit of a downer because she and I were both disappointed by the decision in the drones case. Nice language from Judge Rogers, but lousy result from the court. I, I didn't know that uh, this program was a response to the remarks last year of our good friend and alum, Tom Birkin, who, as Mary Ellen pointed out, is one of the outstanding criminal defense and human rights lawyers in the country. Uh, I share Mary Ellen's view that Tom's um, uh, disappointment, to put it mildly, with the U.S. courts is understandable because he's the one who gets, gets it on the chin each time he loses. Uh, I don't litigate as often as he does, so maybe it's possible for me to be a bit more optimistic than he is. But an having anticipated that Mary Ellen might give you uh, some, some cases that are quite troublesome, uh, I just made notes on a, a few cases on the other side of the ledger of late. Um, two weeks ago, federal courts in Maryland and Hawaii again ruled against the Muslim immigrant ban by President Trump. Um, just a few days ago, Judge Colleen Collar Catelli, uh, a graduate of uh, Catholic University, uh, ruled against the uh, newest uh, Trump ban on transgender people in the military as discriminatory and unjustified on a preliminary basis. Uh, last year, the Fifth Circuit, hardly a bastion of liberalism, ruled that Texas's voter ID law discriminated against minorities 
and the poor. Just in August, a couple of months ago, a long-standing lawsuit against the CIA contractor psychologists who came up with the torture program for the CIA to use uh, during the Bush administration. Uh, the last effort to throw that lawsuit out was defeated, and the result was a settlement uh, for substantial money damages being paid to two of the victims of that torture. Um, one could go on throughout history. Mary Ellen mentioned Dred Scott, the lawsuit that failed to end slavery. Uh, but of course, paired with that, we have to add Brown versus Board, the, the decision in 1954 that ruled that separate but equal is not equal and it's not constitutional. Many other examples. But what I want to do is, is just make a couple of points in the context of a literally a war story. And my points are that the courts are reactive. They can do nothing unless cases are brought before them. And who brings those cases is you, uh, once you graduate or some of you already have. And our colleagues at the American Civil Liberties Union, at the Center for Constitutional Rights, at Tom Durkin's law firm, and many other places. And by the way, Sean O'Brien is co-counsel with Tom Durkin in the Guantanamo case that uh, was mentioned at the outset. And lawyers, in turn, uh, cannot conceive of themselves or their lawsuits or their courts as the whole ballgame. Um, as Arthur Kenoy, great, uh, one of the greatest civil liberties lawyers of the 20th century in this country, used to argue and did so in his autobiography, A People's Lawyers, A People's Lawyer, Lawyers and lawsuits and courts are most effective if they are part of a much broader people's movement. When there is political pressure, when there is organizing, and when the lawsuit is part of and a tool in a broader effort that uses the legislature, the media, public opinion, pressure on politicians in elections, and the courts, and the Constitution, and international law to achieve a result. So the courts, in part, are only as good as we make them. We can't make them better than they are. Uh, the country is at risk right now because of the latest addition to the Supreme Court, in my judgment. But how the courts come out over the next 30 or 40 years will, will depend a great deal on the lawyers being educated in this and other law schools around the country and the extent to which they understand the, the need uh, to work together with groups of uh, victims, with groups of concerned citizens, with groups of people who care about human rights, or as they're called most of the time in this country, civil rights or constitutional rights. We've been there before, as Mary Ellen pointed out, and that brings me to um, just a reminiscence uh, this is 2017, so 15 years ago, 15 years and about three months ago, um, I was walking down the hall in Northwestern Law School, where I was then on the faculty, and this was at the eight-month mark of the opening of Guantanamo. The first prisoners were brought to Gitmo in January of 2002. So it was August of 2002, um, and I was minding my own business in the hallway, and I happened to run across one of my former students, Joe Margulies, who had just, despite his best efforts, lost a case before the District Court of the District of Columbia on behalf of the detainees at Guantanamo. And uh, apropos of Mary Ellen's comment, Joe said, you know, we, we litigated this on the basis of U.S. law. We really need somebody who knows about international law. Are you interested, Doug? And I said, well, sure, yeah. Um, in September, I joined the legal team of about 10 of us who were working on the Guantanamo cases and would continue to work on the Guantanamo cases until we won the first victory in the Supreme Court three years later. At the time that I joined the legal team, this was the legal posture of the government of the United States. That the government of the United States has the right to seize anybody anywhere in the world based on intelligence information 
that leads the U.S. government to believe that the person is a terrorist. And to seize that person and to bring them to Guantanamo, or in some cases to places that are even worse, so-called black sites of the CIA, and to detain them there without access to a lawyer, without any charges, without any access to a court, with no habeas corpus, in a law-free zone, until the war on terrorism is over. Is the war on terrorism over yet? Will it ever be over? This was essentially imposing a life sentence with zero due process of law. Now, in my naivete at the time, I thought just simply stating it that way to a court ought to be good enough to win the case. Um, so we had this conference call. Uh, the brief in the Court of Appeals was due in October. Um, and the question became, well, who's going to write the brief? Dummy me. Everybody else had better excuses than I did. Uh, so I drafted a brief. And the first draft of the brief began with the international law arguments. Rule of law. Uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to which the U.S. is a party. Basic concepts of due process. And then added some some American law arguments. And I shared it with my colleagues, and my colleagues all said, um, nice, nice try, Castle, but take the international law argument, move it from argument number one to argument number six. And they were right, because the international law argument was not the way to lead off with a US Court of Appeals, especially at that time. Uh, so we filed the brief, and a few months later, we got a decision from the US Court of Appeals. And uh, as, a, as a credit to my brief writing talents, we lost even worse before the Court of Appeals than we had before the District Court. So by now, it was about mid-2003, the spring of 2003. We knew we were on our way to the Supreme Court, and we knew we had to change strategy. And we had a series of meetings at NYU Law School in New York. Uh, where Anthony Amsterdam, our guru on the Supreme Court, one of the great Supreme Court litigators of the 20th century, uh, was hosting us. We had experts on habeas corpus. I was the alleged expert on international law. We had experts on this, that, and the other thing. And we put together a strategy that said, if we're going to win this case before the Supreme Court, we have to change the way it looks. If this is a case of the terrorists versus the United States government, Guess who's going to win in a, in a U.S. court? We had to change the whole complexion of the case. It had to become the rule of law versus the United States government. And consistent with that strategy, we recruited a whole series of amicus briefs to support that point of view. Uh, we got a group of former federal judges, appeals court judges and district court judges, to come in and argue that the the theory of the Bush administration that they could hold people forever with no due process uh, was a betrayal of fundamental American principles. Uh, we got the Commonwealth Bar Associations of the common law countries of the world to come in and make the same point and that this would not be allowed in any other country in the common law world. Uh, we got former uh, United States prisoners of war who'd been imprisoned by Germany uh, in World War II to say that what saved them was the Geneva Conventions, the very same Geneva Conventions that the Bush administration said did not apply to the prisoners at Guantanamo. We got Fred Korematsu, uh, the lead person in the World War II Japanese-American detention cases, um, to come in uh, as an amicus curiae in a brief written by Jeff Stone, the then dean of the University of Chicago Law School to point out that we made that mistake once before in World War II. We shouldn't be making it again 50 years later. Parenthetically, in the 1970s, I had the privilege of interviewing uh, Justice Douglas's former law clerk, Vern Countryman, who had been one of my law professors. And I asked, I asked uh, Vern, uh, did Justice Douglas ever want to take back any, any decision he ever made while on the Supreme Court? And Vern didn't hesitate for a second. He said, yes, Korematsu. Uh, Douglas regretted his vote in, in support of that detention case ever since. Um, we had other amicus briefs, but all from people who obviously were not terrorists and did not support terrorism. Uh, 
We submitted them to the Supreme Court. The oral argument was held in April of 2004, and in June of 2004, in a pair of cases, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the prisoners at Guantanamo were entitled to uh, access to federal courts through habeas corpus. The story goes on from there in the courts, but I want to talk about the lawyers. Especially in 2002 and going on, many of you were too young perhaps to remember, but the atmosphere in this country was one of such fear and such opposition uh, to recognition of basic rights for prisoners at Guantanamo uh, that it, was, it, it, it took some lawyers with considerable courage in their own private law firms to step up to the plate and work on these cases. Uh, one of my colleagues, Tom Wilner, uh, was the lead of the international, international uh, dispute section, I think, of Sherman and Sterling, one of the largest law firms in the world and in the United States. And when Tom uh, came in on a pro bono basis to help us out on this team, Sherman and Sterling told him, um, no, you can't do this. And Tom said, well, um, in that case, I'm leaving the firm. And they said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. And he stayed. But what I found was in the years as we were preparing for the Supreme Court battle, and especially after, there was something unique about the legal profession, something unique about lawyers, something unique about people like you long before the Congress woke up, long before the media woke up, long before the public woke up, <coughs> lawyers understood the importance of the rule of law. We get disappointing decisions from judges decade in and decade out. That will always happen. We also, we also win some, as I mentioned at the outset. But without the rule of law, human rights are lost. And we can see that in countries that don't have the rule of law. So my message to all of you is you have a unique professional opportunity, and I would suggest a unique professional responsibility to uphold the best tradition of the bar and to put yourself on the line to do your best, uh, to keep on keeping on, as Mary Ellen said, uh, because we don't lose all these cases and we always have to try our best uh, to win them uh, because without that pressure, uh, the rule of law will be seriously eroded. We can't leave it to the executive. We can't leave it to the legislature. The courts are key and the courts can only act if you do. Thank you. Now, we promise not to take any questions. You all go home. <laughs> no, sir. Uh, I have one question, Professor, regarding uh, use of after law. Uh, there's, uh, there was a prison, background prison at my side, and it was closed because of this political movement, legal movement that we have made here. And the Rahmatullah case, which we have studied in accountability, was one of the key that this program was closed. And this prison, this Rahmatullah uh, for 10 years without charges here. Then, because Kazai, who was the president, and also the other lawyers, they had media, lawyers, everything had political movement, and it had an effect, and it was closed. But there was a clause under the agreement that we, that the United States is going to keep one block within this within this prison. So whenever we capture a terrorist, we keep him for two, three months to investigate the gravity of the threats to the United States. And during this three months or four months, of course, there are some abuses in terms of interrogation. And this political movement did not go <coughs> meaning that sometimes this movement works to the extent that's after that it stops. And second, regarding the drones, there have been more than 15 drones mistakenly on civilians. And then you, uh, Afghanistan government asked the US, the 
to uh, prosecute all these in Afghanistan, then they say, okay, in the US. Then Afghanistan agreed. But there is no disclosure to the Afghan people what happened to these civil, to these perpetrators that have missed the name, put the drone in the Thank you. You want to take the drones? Yes. Do you want to take the first? I'll point? take the other one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we should work together more often. Yeah, that's right. Uh, on detentions, if any of you have not seen the Oscar award-winning documentary film, Taxi to the Dark Side, uh, if you want to know about U.S. detentions and torture in the various detention centers in Afghanistan, um, there's nothing I could say and nothing you could read that would, would be as compelling as seeing that film, which I'm sure is available on the internet, Taxi to the Dark Side. Um, it's, I'll, I'll say one more thing before Mary Ellen addresses the drones question because she's probably the leading spokesperson in this country in terms of uh, the international law opposition to the use of, of drones. And that is uh, just within the last uh, week or so, uh, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has announced that she will seek to open, uh, she needs permission from the ICC judges, will seek to open an investigation of some of the alleged US war crimes committed in Afghanistan. Uh, that's an example of how when US courts, uh, for whatever reason, do not deal with an issue, and the US courts have not dealt effectively with uh, the violations in Afghanistan, uh, that there are times when we can turn to international instances it's way too soon to say what will happen with this, of course. There will be all kinds of practical and legal obstacles in the way of bringing these cases to justice. But the fact that the International Criminal Court uh, prosecutor has been willing to start the process in this way um, is encouraging. Mary Ellen? Yeah, and I'll just an answer more briefly to say that um, there have been multiple, you, you mentioned 15, yes. but there are... Uh, and it's going to get worse before it gets better, I'm afraid, Abdul, because uh, President Obama, following advice from his um, counterinsurgency uh, uh, folks, was aiming for a zero civilian casualty uh, situation as part of the better way to fight an insurgency or a civil war to have a better chance of success. And President Trump has plainly thrown that out the door and is it and has removed any idea of zero civilian uh, casualties in Iraq and Syria or in um, uh, uh, Afghanistan. And of course, President Obama had no such qualms about civilian casualties. Everyone outside an armed conflict zone is a civilian. So everyone who died in a drone strike was a civilian. Um, so I'm afraid it's going to get worse before it gets better since President Trump is also increasing the troop. So what do we do in response to that? The kind of persistence taking heart from the positive cases that we heard from Professor Castle and doing the thing that, um, that, that some of you, um, I see you're smiling, so you're probably thinking already about how can we be creative? How can we think about those cases that have worked? and apply them to the problems going forward. What, where are we failing to be effective in our arguments? And that's, what, that's the kind of work where, uh, as, as Doug said, courts are reactive, but really we lawyers are reactive. We're always backward looking and looking at precedent, seeing how things were done in the past, bringing that, because that is the law. But maybe we need to incorporate more creativity, <coughs> more sense of, uh, outside the box thinking, um, I think it's it's very uh, creative of the ICC. It's very brave of her, but we're seeing a, a real turn, and maybe this is an opportune moment to start this kind of new thinking. What might work? What are the valuable lessons of the past? But what are the lessons we haven't thought of yet? Uh, because maybe five years ago under Obama, she would never have brought a case investigating U.S. conduct. There's more of a mood now. And with that kind of outside uh, examination of the law and evaluation of what's going wrong, that can filter back into the exact uh, point. I, I made a note of 
uh, Professor Castle's comment that real change of the kind we're talking about, this more fundamental change, the courts absolutely have a role, but it has to be part of a political process that involves our elected leaders, but popular movements as well. And please let it be a well-educated movement, not one that's just based on what you, you know, read in your Instagram um, <laughs> the other day. There's a real role for deep knowledge, and we all have that chance being part of a university. So that's my only real fear is uh, if we get bad decisions out of these processes, we're not going to be in a better place. So uh, we have to take great care. It can't just be, uh, it's got to be thought through and carefully. But that's, uh, uh, I, I invite everyone to be persistent in looking back at what has gone on in Afghanistan, cases of torture by US uh, officials that were never prosecuted and never prosecuted effectively. There's a lot of accountability to be had that could address and put restrictions on problems going forward. And and, and you, you, yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, so are you suggesting It is every day. Right. So, uh, and not just customary law, law, treaties and general treaties and general principles as well. Right. Not, not just customary. And so, and use Kogan's norms, those peremptory higher norms, part of all law. So can you explain how that interacts with the Constitution? Because um, you know, like customary law is composed of decisions that the courts of other countries do, and those aren't our Supreme Court decisions. Right. Well. The the, 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 um, you would love to take an international law course, I think. Um, it, it's, it would be truly, I think you'll find it fascinating. I'll just cite one, the Supreme Court precedent on the place of customary international law in U.S. law, drawn from the place, from interpretation of the Constitution, and that's the 1900 Paquetta Habana decision in which the <clears throat> Navy was sued by a small group of fishermen from Cuba. And the Supreme Court said in a statement that has never been contradicted, customary international law is part of the law of the United States to be applied as relevant in every case. So that's, that's where customary international law is. The great Lewis Hankin, the greatest uh, specialist on the place of international law in the US constitutional system, explained drawing on Philip Jessup, you know him from the Jessup competition, Right? Right. Um, Philip Jessup said that uh, customary international law has the same status as treaties. And of course, you know well that treaties are specified expressly as the supreme law of the land. So custom, and I would say general principles as well. And then we don't have to worry about the higher norms, the principles against genocide and slavery. That, that's part of all law, uh, natural law principles. So yes, it's all available for U.S. courts. Mary Ellen's given you a legal answer. Let me put it a little differently. <laughs> Customary international law is as American as apple pie. Why do I say that? Because we were born in the common law. And as long ago as the late 1700s, uh, the judges of England ruled that customary international law, or the law of nations as it was known then, was part of the English common law. And as recently as the last uh, 10 years, or now it's 13 years ago, the, the, uh, what is now the Supreme Court of England ruled against the equivalent of a Guantanamo type situation at Belmarsh Prison in England, in part on the basis of incorporating customary international law into the common law. So yeah, of course on international law is a good idea, but this is not uh, you know, a radical innovation. This has been around for a long time. And yet I wanted to have a radical innovation. Right? Why not? Go for it. No, no radical innovation. Mitchell. Um, thank you. I think it's going to explain a lot of the foreign lawyers here to get aspects of American lawyers in their system. Um, I wanted to comment on you thinking about sort of being just disheartened by the courts here and the judicial system. But, but I, I mean, my country, South Africa, we also have a very good judiciary, and a very strong, very independent. There's generally high compliance with it. So as a lawyer operating there, they don't really have to doubt that. Um, but a lot of my colleagues come from systems where, you know, judges are corrupt, judges are this. If they still win, 
they still take cases there, and they still fight, I mean, which is amazing for me, thinking about that. Um, so even in these very adverse circumstances without, without a very strong judiciary, you still have wins. Obviously, you still have lost in that court. Um, but the second thing I want to speak about, there's a, there's a South African academic who teaches at the Institute of Toronto now, and he has a PhD in Oxford. And he wrote a book on his PhD thesis called Hard Cases in Liquid Legal Systems. And it's a very philosophical sort of book. And he, he was dealing with security laws under apartheid. Um, and following from the, I think it's Leverage versus Anderson, which is a House of Lords case from World War II, about security laws and the role of the judiciary in dealing with executive conduct and really executive conduct and the sort of legacy of executive conduct. And he warns in his last chapter of the book that even in a sort of a strong judicial system, not in a weakest legal system, you can still have a slow erosion where the, the executive, you know, the judiciary starts becoming differential to the executive and that sort of thing. So I think it's it's important to highlight that the US has a good judicial system, but that you don't lose your judicial system overnight. It's, it's, it's case by case, it's day by day. And only after five years you look back and you go, wow, you know, now I can see how to find out those same cases. So it's important for all of us in the room, or I think many of us, maybe the American ones, more like, and one of us from our own countries to recognize that we're part of that. You know, whenever, whenever you're taking a case or writing a journal article or whatever you have become a judge, you have to follow, um, and Professor Gasser mentioned this other day in class about the regional systems. Like, you can never, you never like, get complacent and think yeah, back. Yeah. That's the point to be. Sort of a, never get complacent, no matter how great you think your system is, because legal systems are human creations. They're human constructs. And we're fallible. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we, we're not creating perfect systems. So they constantly have to be kept in, in mind. And just having a panel like this, I have to compliment the organizers. Um, they are part of that oversight, bringing this message to all of you so we don't get complacent. It's, it's easy to do when it's a slow erosion. And, the, and that's when I said, I don't want us to overstate the problem. I, I exactly see that it's not this overwhelming problem that, that we're facing a revolutionary Breach. It's, we're not Weimar Germany, where uh, a Hitler-type figure is about to completely end true rule of law. That's true, Mr. White. It's not a Weimar Germany. I'm confident of that. But in in some ways, that's more challenging, because uh, you know the the uh, people took up arms and became partisans against the the fascist regimes in Europe. We don't have to do that, but we do have to be alert. Um, to make sure that our system doesn't suffer that same fate. Because there were people in Germany, um, in Weimar, who just believed that their country was too civilized. And, and then it was too late. It's good to commend the organizers, and I join in that, but I also commend all of you. Uh, because by coming here, you've shown interest. And I want to point out, especially for the American law students here, um, you don't have to envision that you're going to uh, work for one of the non-governmental organizations like the ACLU that works on these kinds of cases. The overwhelming majority of the, of the legal uh, firepower that we had in the Guantanamo litigation came from lawyers in big commercial law firms working on a pro bono basis. So no matter what field of law you go into, if you care about human rights, there are ways you can get involved. And in fact, if you have a big firm backing you up in some ways that can uh, provide you the additional economic resources that you need to be even more helpful. So there's nobody in here who should feel that, you know, this is, this is nice to talk about, but I can't really afford to do it. Uh, think, think about what matters to you in life and how you want to have that help shape your choice of legal career. That, that was exactly the position I was in. I worked for Covington and Burling, a big <clears throat> firm. Washington. I was in Washington, D.C. We did all kinds of international law work for uh, United Airlines, for Amoco Oil Company. Uh, we had the biggest case in the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal. We had arbitrations against Iran. It was uh, great practice. I was able to pay my student loans without too much difficulty. I loved it. But I also had a chance to take to be part of the first challenge to executing uh, juveniles in this country, people who were under the age of 18 when they committed a crime. We were executing those people. We lost that case in the Supreme Court. At the time, I uh, was part of the effort. It took 10 more years 
more than that. 20, I think. 20 yeah. years after, uh, after those first cases, Sanford was the set of cases. We were, uh, so Roper, and that's the lesson. You have to be persistent. If you're confident, you're convicted, but you also have to pay the rent and so forth. So we're not actually asking for such a big lift. You can get you know, help, because the great thing about law is it's a helping profession across the board. And we can all be good officers of the court, do our job well for our own clients, maintaining always a high level of professional responsibility. But coming from this law school, I think the temptation is always to do more and be part of something bigger. And in, in those of you who have the special education, the special privilege of being well-educated in international law, I think you do have a responsibility to do more. You've got that uh, knowledge and you should use it for good. Mona. Oh boy, <laughs> you, should, you should read the New York Times article that came out just a few days ago. Guess who no longer wants to send people to Gitmo? Because Gitmo can't convict anybody. The Republicans, the Attorney General, President and Trump. now even President Trump. Wow. This, this latest That's guy who, well, he, he changed his mind. <laughs> he changed his mind publicly after, you're right, whatever he says, one has to wait until tomorrow, but, but. <laughs> But Attorney General Sessions came out in favor of trying Saifulo Saipov, this guy who just ran the truck down and killed a bunch of people on bicycles and walking along the park lane in Manhattan, wants to try him in civilian court. They haven't sent anybody to Guantanamo to get tried in, in a long time. And the reason, they're do, the reason they're not sending them there is because there's been so much resistance, including by the by the defense counsel that Mary Ellen mentioned earlier. There's been so much resistance over so long to military commission trials and detention at Guantanamo <coughs> that they haven't been able to, to do very much there. And meanwhile, civilian courts in the United States have been successful in prosecuting people. So drip by drip, you make it so difficult for them to go that route that they come to their senses and say, well, let's, let's go back to civilian independent courts in the United States. But not to be too positive about everything, um, <laughs> I would never have believed, I would never have believed that Barack Obama, professor of constitutional law at the great University of Chicago, would ever have tolerated indefinite detention. And that came to be an accepted point in his administration. And I, I, I just simply refuse to believe that a person of his abilities with the talent pool he could draw on found no legal way, somebody who was able to come up with the, the dreamers and so many other creative, the uh, commitment to the Paris Agreement because it was a mere protocol. Um, and he couldn't find a way to say it is unconstitutional to hold people indefinitely without a fair trial because some of the people are not being preferred for any judicial process. They just get their every six month ersatz review, which is, is somehow cobbled together on the Geneva Convention requirement of a periodic review for security detentions, people who are not prisoners of war. But it, it, it's got nothing to do with what the black letter rule on, um, on, on that detention hand holds. Uh-oh. <laughs> and on that unhappy note. It is 1.30 now.